for Pastor Stevens, First Lady Stevens, members of the board, and every member of the Global Encounter Ministry family, and where every message would go. Father, we commend into your hands. As we study the message tonight, the sixth to last of the messages of the seven churches of, Rebelli uh, of the Asia of Asia. As we look at the Church of Philadelphia tonight, open our understanding. Holy Spirit, these are not just mere words. I look to you tonight for insight. I'm asking for illumination. And Lord, we take authority tonight against the opposition of the enemy. We come against every satanic attack on this Bible study. We come against every program of evil that is released into and around the sharing of this word. Lord, every obstacle by demons, by devils, by circumstances, to nullify the efficacy of what is being taught. Spirit of God, take control of this session tonight and minister to us in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to greet you all as we prepare to go into this. First of all, I want us to read a portion of scripture that is before us. We are looking at, this is the Church of Philadelphia. Last week, we looked at the Church of um, Sadist, which was the church that Jesus alleged that they were, they had a name, an onama, a, they had a label, they had titles. He said, but you're dead. That blew my mind because it's so applicable to us today, what's going on in the body of Christ, that many people are claiming this, making all kinds of claims, who are doctors, who are prophets, who are apostles. We are power hungry for titles, and we have little to show for the claims we are making. And we have to be very careful each of us, and because I'm speaking specifically to, the, to our Global Encounter Ministries Church, and wherever the message will take, the, uh, the Holy Spirit will take the wings of this message and take it, that every one of us should come before God. It's not what you think of yourself. It's not what others say about you. It's what God says. And that is the message. It's not what someone declared about you, wrote about you. How many doctors or people of status were to confirm certain qualities about you? That's not the final authority. He's saying to us, each of us, on this matter. It's not the claims we make. It's not the reputation that we have built. It's what God says. What is he saying about you and I? I mean, he loves us. He paid a price for us. And he's not willing to for us to live under guilt and condemnation. That's not the objective. But to have God's assessment on us, What is God saying to us? Are we hardworking? Are we kind? Are we generous? Are we like the church of Ephesus? All the qualities of the apostolic age. Or the church of Smyrna, the persecuted church. Or the church of Pergamum. Or the church of Thyatira. 
or the church of Sardis that make all the grandiose claim we are alive. They were a big church. The Lord said, you're dead. He told the church of Ephesus, you've left your first love. He commended the church of Smyrna for what? For their willingness to suffer. And in that church, you had people like Polycarp, the great champion who stood at the age of 86 years and died, surrendered his life. Like the great martyr of the church of Pergamum, Antipas, the very meaning of his name means against all. He was willing to go against everything for the cause of Christ. He too was martyred. But he had in the church of Smyrna, many that were dying and persecuted. But then in that church, you had the false prophetess, Jezebel, the woman, the woman with the spirit of Jezebel. Some, be, some believe she was the pastor's wife, teaching the men how to fornicate and to eat foods offered to idols. And when you come right down to each church, how God dealt with them, what he said to them, we need to make personal application on what we are being taught. This is very serious. Each of us must do it. And collectively, if we do it individually, it will be done collectively. Do not point fingers. This one or that one, we must make it personally. What is God saying to you and I in this hour as the coming of Christ draws nearer? We are a minute to midnight on the prophetic clock. We are much nearer than we have ever been in the history of the church. And the message to the seven churches is a good way to analyze and to refocus, recalibrate ourselves in the light of how the Lord dealt with those seven conditions in those churches. They had great bless, great qualities, but they also had major issues that cause our Lord great concern. If we, any of us, manifest any of these qualities, like in the church of Ephesus, losing your first love, that is very common. Very common. Losing it. In the church of Smyrna, a persecuted church, one of the churches that Nothing bad was said about it. The Lord said, be faithful unto death. Just be faithful. Regardless of what you go through, make up your mind. I won't deliver you out of the persecution you'll have to go through, but be faithful unto death. I believe great persecution is coming to the church. I believe this with all my heart. And we better learn the message from each one of these. The church of uh, 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 of Smyrna, but Polycarp was a great example. Persecuted church, Church of Pergamum, the church that was backslidden and married to the world, with teachers teaching messages of gradualism, taking it easy, compromising with the world in order to survive. The Pergamos church. The backslidden church, anyone who go the route of compromise, that's the message of Pergamon. In order to make it, fake it until they make it. Don't have no problems fornicating, living a life of uh, an adulterous or life of immorality or, or subjugating oneself to false teachings because of the pressure you're under. That's what was going on in that church, the church of Pergamon. And then you have the church of, of Thyatira, that powerful church 
great qualities. But also in that church, you had, like in Pergamum, you had the, the, the pastor's wife or the woman with the spirit of Jezebel. In the church of Pergamum, you had those who were teaching the doctrine of Balak, who taught Balak how to put a stumbling block in the pathway of the blessed people of God whom the devil could not curse. All the witchcraft that Balaam could not pronounce upon those people. He knew how to get at them. I can't attack them from the outside, but they could make them fall from within. And that was the lesson we have to learn there. Look at, go through every one of these messages. Everyone. And the Lord came after those teachers. He said, I'm going to come and I'm going to fight you with the sword of my mouth. He was talking to the false teachers in the church of Pergamon who were misleading the saints who were being persecuted from the public and from the state and from the Jews. That's what, that is what went on both in the church of Pergamon and in in the church of Thyatira. Then you had, so in the church of Pergamum, they who were teaching the doctrine of Balaam and they who were teaching the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. How to compromise. And the church of, Thy of, the church of Thyatira, great qualities, but what was the problem? Another woman now, this time in Thyatira, possibly the pastor's wife, who were leading the leaders of that church into a lifestyle of promiscuity and how to eat food offered to idols. Because it was how we are saying, guys, if we are going to make it in a pagan environment, if we do not begin to be smart enough to compromise a little bit, burn a little incense in order to, to, to uh, and raise your hand to Caesar and say, Caesar is God. And in your heart, you can say, Lord, forgive me. They were under a lot of pressure. And, but we have to understand how serious the times in which we are living. So the church of both Pergamum and Thyatira had major problems of false teachers teaching the, the membership and their leadership how to deal with persecution and the way to do it, compromise. If we have, if, in those churches, if you were part of those trade guilds or unions and you became a member, you had to attend sessions where you bow down to worship the patron God, honor and treat the emperor as God, raise your hands, declare that Caesar is God, and they give you a certificate. Then you could work. Then you could earn a living. They had, they were forced to compromise. That's why we give you all that information. So you'll begin to understand, not in your own modern 21st century eyes, but in the eyes of the environment in which those churches were placed. And thank God we are not there, but brother, sister, global family, I believe we are moving perilously towards a period of darkness and great persecution. And I believe it's going to happen before Christ comes. I believe there's going to be suffering before Christ comes. I don't believe the church is just going to go up and the Lord free you and there'll be no trouble. We are going to go through something before Christ shows up. And these messages will help prepare us. Let's take it seriously. So we look at Sardis. That was the church that was deceived. They thought that they were alive. That's the one we looked at last week. But the Lord's, the Lord's assessment is that you're dead. The calling is up alive. The call is up living. But you're dead. Tonight, we are looking at the church of Philadelphia. This is an amazing church. It's the other church 
that did not get any criticism. And you'll see why. It seems as though there's a parallel between Smyrna and the Church of Pergamon. If you observe in Smyrna, they were persecuted. A lot of people, uh, Polycarp was killed, the 86-year-old great man of God, the church father. And there were many of the Christians hauled into the arenas and were thrown to the lions and burned to the stake, right? Um, and they were dying in Smyrna and in Pergamon. And it was in Pergamon where the compromise was made, where the people were teaching the doctrine of Balaam how to deal with the conflict, how to deal with the persecution, how to protect your own skin in the light of the persecution. So we're going to look at tonight the church of Philadelphia. Let's turn to the portion of scripture. And we are reading from verse 7. Verse 7 to verse 13. Everybody, the Bible is open. And we are looking at verse 7 to verse 13. We already prayed, and so we have over 10 of us. Let's move into the reading. Sister Borneo, I love your reading, and I want to see if I can activate another reader. Oh, yeah, it's just about seven verses. Sister Borneo, read for us the seven verses. Verses 7 to verse 13. And the rest of us will follow you. Go on. Are you there? Maybe she stepped away. Maybe she stepped away. Let me see. All right. Sister Susan Clark, Susan, are you there? From Trent City? Okay, then I will have to read. Maybe this. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hello? Okay. Okay, so, okay, Sister Bonio. Okay, I'm going to ask. Was... Okay, Sister Bonio. That was okay. Thank you, Susan. Sister Bonio, Bonio I want you to do the reading for us. From verse, verse, verse 7. From verse 7. To verse, to verse 13. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, write this. I'm reading from the new National um, Living Translation, okay? Mm -hmm. No, do me one favor once you're doing that. When it uh -huh. comes to the end of each verse, announce it. Because okay, some right. people... Right, go ahead. Okay. Yes. Okay. Verse 7, write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true. The one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. That's the end of verse 7. Go ahead, yes. Verse 8, I know all the things you do. And I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Verse 9, look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue. Those liars who say are Jews but are not to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. It's 10. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. This 11, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. This 12, all who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God and they will be citizens in the city of my God. The new Jerusalem, that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Verse 13, 
Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Beautiful, beautiful reading, beautiful reading. So what I'm going to do at this time, I'm going to introduce to you. Thank you very much, Sister Monio. And may the Lord continue to add illumination to us. As we read, we're doing a little different tonight. I'm not, we, we, what we are going to do, we're going to do the reading. When I'm through doing the reading, I have just three photos of what Philadelphia looked like today. The, what has been excavated because all of that, that part, those um, ancient cities are beneath the modern cities are built over the ancient cities. The, those cities are now reduced to rubble because that is the nature of civilization. Civilizations, like a human being, is born uh, uh, in youth and grow up. Uh, it has its toddler years into teenage, maturity, old age, decay, and death. That is what happened even to great nations. Like people, that's the cycle. You see a young person who was a baby, one of your own children. I mean, by the time you turn around, it's an adult. Person going to, that, uh, that that young person is now walking down the aisles, getting given in marriage. What's the result? Children of their own, you become grandparents, and the cycle goes around. Countries and civilizations. We looked at in the book of Daniel, chapter two, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had, a pagan king thinking. Who will come after me? And the Lord gave him a vision of what will happen from him, his time, on to the end of time. Could you imagine that? You know, that blows my mind all the time. God gave to a, a pagan king laying down on his bed one night, a great king built a great kingdom, and is wondering, who will come after me? What will be the future of this great kingdom? And God showed him, you're not, the, you're not the lone pebble on God's beach, to borrow a Pastor Alexander expression. Who are you? You, after you will come, your kingdom will come to an end. And the Medes and the Persians will overthrow you. You'll have great kings. You'll build a great country, but it will be overthrown by the Medes and the Persians. And I, 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 when Babylon was taken down, the Medes and the Persians came up. Cyrus, Darius, those two nations came together as co-regions. They too had great kings. But just as God said, there was a leopard coming. Leopard named Alexander the Great who will overthrow the bear because the Medes and the Persian was symbolic as the bear. The lion was overthrown by, by the bear, the Medes and the Persians. Then the leopard came with agility and speed in the person of Alexander. Alexander the Great, at the age of 20, died in his early 30s. And his kingdom was divided between his four generals. Just as God said, just as God predicted, and I'm saying this for a purpose, just as God predicted it was happen, it would happen, it occurred. Alexander died at the age of 33. His four generals took over the empire, fought between themselves. They killed every member of Alexander the Great's family, his children, his half-wit brother, his sisters, his mother. I think even his father was, assass was, was assassinated. Well, some people believe that Alexander the Great had a hand in the assassination of his father. They had issues, right? Alexander died, the generals ruled, 
and especially under the general in Egypt, Ptolemaic, and the, 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 those that were in, the, in, in this UN empire there fought, the, the Lucid Empire fought between each other for over 300 years. Then came the legs of iron, the Romans, and overthrew them. Overthrew them. God meticulously, accurately, with surgical precision, described who was coming and what will happen with specificity. No mistake. Romans came and overthrew Alexander the Great. And then the Bible shows us after the long legs of iron, the long reign of Rome, it was morphed into ten toes, over which a man called the Antichrist would rise. We are now in the period of the old revived Roman Empire. Those countries that were part of the ancient Roman Empire are still around today with modern names, with polit growing in political influence. The actors are on the stage. The intro music is presented. The stage is set. What you're seeing in Ukraine what you're seeing going on with the 2019 COVID-19 was the chapter. And what's happening now in Ukraine in that war? These are major factors that are going to shift and cause a lot of events, prophetic events, to fall into place. And after the 10 toes, but a man called the Antichrist, the entire world will come together under the Antichrist with 10 powerful nations ruling with him to control the world. The world will become a one world political system along with a one world religion. And then the Antichrist will supplant that religion and become the dominant man. Right after that will come the stone kingdom. If you reach, reach chapter two of Daniel again, that's where we are now. That's why we took these months to study these two books. I want you to get it well. And now we are tonight at the position looking at the sixth church. Second to last, the Church of Philadelphia. I have notes and written notes that I felt I wanted to prepare and read rather than to give you. Um, I could still at other time put post up information there so you could have some extra reading on the book on Philadelphia, the Church of Philadelphia. But this is what I want you to pay attention, and it begins. Today, the ancient city of Philadelphia is hidden under the buildings of the modern Turkish city, but it really is where the ancient Philadelphia was. Ancient city of Philadelphia is under the modern city of Turkey. That's where it is. I want to show you some slides, there's about three, four of them to give, show you what the remains. All of these powerful countries, nations, will be reduced to nothingness. That's how great countries rise, peak, reach their summit, begin their decline, and subsequently, like an old age man, give up the ghost. America is in its state. It's a dying superpower. Philadelphia was established two centuries before Christ. 
And there was a king who loved this brother named Attalus. He loved this brother so much that he decided to build this city and call it Philadelphia. We both know what that was because you heard that the Greek word phileo is the word, Greek word for love. And Delphos means brother. And that is really, Delphos is really a biological term. Huh? It speaks of a womb. It speaks of a womb. So it talk of, 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 of two persons who are coming from the same womb. City of brotherly love. Abdelfo, so the city here in America called Philadelphia came from this, the very idea of this ancient city. And these two Greek words, phileo, love, Adelphos, brother, give you Philadelphia. And this king who loved his brother, hear what happened here, right? He loved his brother, Atlas, so much that he decided to build this city and call it Philadelphia, which means the city of brotherly love. And this was so in commemoration of the deep love he has for his brother. That is heartwarming that you can have people who could, family who could love each other so deeply. You have a country here that's falling apart at the seams. Once upon a time, America took great pride in her love of country, love for the principles of democracy. And she's turned her back on that because of a fear of white brothers and sisters, the fear of becoming a minority race in their own country. That is what has been needed. That's what's been needed. That apparent <laughs> uh, 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 um, recklessness we're seeing, that you will violate the very tenets of your democracy. This is the home, the mother of democracy, as Russia was the mother of communism. She died. And this country, the mother of democracy, you have the uh, Republican Party violating the rules of engagement. They do not want. They did not want the investigation after the January sixth attempted overthrow or coup. They are, they are very much opposed of Mr. Trump being investigated for taking sensitive documents that doesn't belong to him. None of them have rebuked him. Then we have a gentleman who found himself in the home of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, beat him with a hammer in the presence of police. Documentation show he's an avid supporter of the ex or the former president. How many of the, the establishment Republican members of Congress, of the Senate, how many of them stood up and said anything? They're demonizing, they're jumping to all kinds of creative views. Oh, how that more looked like um, not a break in, but a break out. And all the kind of uh, conspiracy theories that is emanating out of that. It's a sad. Where is the, the powers of compassion? A man in his own home, beaten. And the Christian party, all the great Christian pastors who a part of that system, I have not heard one of them open their mouth in denunciation and said, I am a Republican, but this is not the Republican Party that I, as a believer, as a man of God, 
can remain in the silent. I cannot support it. If you all do not get your, your, your act right, I am going to move away. I become an independent if I don't want to support the Republicans, the Democrats, but I cannot be part of this. And you're not hearing that. That's what's scary. This country is on the pathway. I've been saying it since summer of 2020. This party is pushing this country towards civil war. Is it? I don't know. Is it, is it the reason why they're pushing for civil war? Maybe if they, they have more guns than most people, they have been preparing for civil war, war for a long time. I don't know if the possible if the idea is we can slaughter many of the minority people. We, is it the, the, the attempt to demonize, to demonize immigrants? This is an immigrant country. You have to be concerned. But what I'm saying is we are watching the decline of, of a great country. The only thing I was preaching on the weekend and I told the folk, the only thing that can change the direction of this country is a revival. God has to change the heart of the church and really come upon it and clean, cleanse our hearts from all of the dirtiness that's going on. God has to help us. That's what we know. So here you have this king that loved his brother, built this great city and name it Philadelphia. This was an important city because it was a border town. Where it was situated was bordering to the gateway of all of Asia and beyond. It was strategically located, you see. It sat on the border of Lydia, Pergia, and it was believed that the city had a special mission. They believed that the city had a special mission. What was that mission? Their goal was to export Greek culture and Greek, the Greek language to all the surrounding areas. You can say that Philadelphia was the open door into those regions and that is important because we're gonna see the same expression used towards the church by the Lord Jesus. Right? So when you read further, you will see that Christ said to the church of Philadelphia in this chapter three, he said, I have set before thee an open door. And is he wrapped up even in the history of the community, of the state. In the secular setting, this was also a reality. They became pillars promoters of the life of, 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 of lifestyle of the Greeks. So that also was the testimony of the city. They had open doors into other regions. It was a very well situated place. And likewise, the church here had the goal to become mission, missionary to take the message of the gospel, we're gonna to come to that. But in the secular setting, Philadelphia was set up there to become the promoters of the lifestyle of the Greek language, Greek culture, and everything that was Greek. The city was so fabulous that Strabo, who was Strabo? The ancient historian said it was little, it was like little Athens. That was the objective. But there was a lot of volcanic activity here. 
we saw that, was it um, one of those other churches had major issues with, um, well, it was a not, not, not volcanic activity really, earthquakes, right? So uh, the city was so fabulous that Strabo, the ancient historian said, it was like little Athens, but there was a lot of volcanic or earthquake activity. In fact, so much uh, earthquake activity occurred that in 1780, the city was decimated by an earthquake. Make a note of, it, of that, 1780, the city of Philadelphia was decimated. The Emperor Tiberius rebuilt it, but the people were afraid to live in the city. They were really concerned that another earthquake would bring down on them the surrounding structures and that they will die. So they lived outside the city, but the inside of the city was just magnificent, beautiful. All of this occurred right here. By and we're gonna, we're gonna take. Um, let me give you all a, a quick look, um, uh, Krista. Let's just put a posting of what the remains, and we are going to also see the. The prophetic declaration that when God said, I'll make you pillars. This is the, rem uh, the remains of Philadelphia. You see those major pillars of the ancient city? That is also prophetic. We'll come to that. Just remember I told you about the pillars. This city, that is the, the go to the, uh, another uh, of the slide. All of that remains pillars. All that they have here, the remaining of the city is this, but the vast majority of Philadelphia is the modern city of Turkey is built over it. But this is part of the excavation, which showed you what is the, or what we mean, the excavation of the city of Philadelphia, all right? Uh, so it was, so let's look at the geography, a little more the geography of the city. It was right on the Eastern border, right? It's on the Eastern border of Asia. This is very important you're gonna find out why this is important. It was right on the Eastern border. And if you went beyond Philadelphia, you would you are left with Asia and you enter into the rest of Asia Minor. And you are on your way to Assyria because that's where the roads went. This was foreign territory. So they were right on the very eastern edge of Asia. It was a major border to all of Asia. It was a gateway to Asia, very strategic. We know that the city of Philadelphia was founded by Eumenes, uh, E-U-M-E-N-E-S, Eumenes II the king of Lydia, who named the city after his, after his brother, whom he loved dearly. We know that the city of Philadelphia, because of its location, became very strategic for commerce, for trade, because it was, it was the open door to the east. If he wanted to reach the east, you had to pass through Philadelphia. That's how significant it was. And this meant Philadelphia became very important for commerce and for trade. And as a result, it became very wealthy. 
We know it's very important and because we're going to see the emphasis of this spoken by the Lord Jesus, the importance of this city. The Church of Philadelphia, we also know that humanists basically designed and formed Philadelphia to be like a missionary city. It was the last outpost of Greek civilization and Greek culture. Beyond that, who knows what's there? But the people of Philadelphia believe because of where they were situated on the border with an open door to the east that they were responsible to take their culture, Greek culture, civilization beyond their borders through the open door into the east where they would colonize new areas and replicate Greek culture, civilization, and the Greek language in all the regions. So they saw themselves as really missionaries to promote, to promulgate Greek culture, Greek language, uh, and the Greek way of life, right? The city was so luxurious that Strabo, the ancient Roman historian, said it was like little Athens. It was just fabulous. In fact, the architecture there was outstanding. It had a theater. It had a beautiful downtown district. It had a huge stadium. It was simply a remarkable city. And all around the city of Philadelphia, there was vineyards. Oh, you know that what that is, a lot of wine. And their agriculture business was wine and grapes. The city was dedicated to Dionys Dionysus, who was the god, the patron god of wine revelry during room times. This God was called Bacchus. Anybody have an idea what that means? Bacchanal. Bacchanal. <laughs> from whence we get our carnival. Came from this. This was the God of revelry, right? So Bacchus. He was a god of wine, revelry during Roman times. He was called Bacchus. And he was also called the god of orgies. Org so wherever you have this kind of lifestyle, you're, you're moving right into sensuality. A god of, I mean, you talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. So the city was dedicated to the god Dionysus, who better became known as Bacchus. Philadelphia was subjected to a lot. We just stated that earthquakes. And this is important for you to note because you'll understand some of the issues that the church had there. They were suffering because of some of the issues, the economic and the issue of the earthquakes. As said earlier, in the year 1780, there was a massive earthquake that decimated the entire city of Philadelphia. By that time, it became a part of the Roman province of Asia. So the Roman emperor Tiberius gave the order for it to be rebuilt after the earthquake. And he provided some of the funds for the rebuilding. The rest of the funds were taken from the local citizens. You know what taxes is? Increased taxes. Who were taxed in order to rebuild the city of Philadelphia? Because they were so heavily taxed, the people in Philadelphia even thought they were living in a place that mirrored Athens, great opulence, because of the immense burden 
of the taxes and the ongoing uh, uh, tremors from the earthquakes. They said that the tremors lasted for almost 20 years, but it's Pastor, Pastor Stephen. So, the, the major earthquake tremors continued coming for a period of 20 years. That impacted the people. They, the people were afraid to live in the city. So they moved outside of the city. They came into the city to do business, but they lived in huts outside of the city. So in light of these issues facing the city, the church was now positioned to take advantage of the great open door of evangelism. It is when people are suffering, their hearts are open. Tremors for 20 years after the major earthquake, a beautiful city that the people were not taking a chance to go in there and build any house and to have another, another event of an earthquake that will destroy their lives with these, because I mean, they had a big stadium there, they had theaters there, they had an opulent, well, for the time, modern city. But the people said, no way, Jose. I ain't going to live in there. I'll shop, I'll do my business, but I'm living outside the city. And that was the issue. And that is the background of what, now as you begin to read the context, what Jesus is saying, now you begin to understand why he spoke to them the way he did. Now let's go back now, because most of us were not here at the beginning of the reading. Sister Borneo read, no, I want to go through very quickly the quick exegesis of from verse seven to verse 13. And to the angel of the church, everybody, uh, Revelation chapter three from verse seven to verse 13. So we have a, an understanding of the background of Philadelphia. <laughs> We will always do this to give you an idea because if you just were to read the scriptures without giving you the history, the, the, the um, geography of this uh, of the church, you will never understand what they went through. So in verse 7 now, let's begin. I'm going to read from the King James and I'm going to use the other versions when necessary. All right? Verse 7. Follow me as I read. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, these things said, he that is holy. Remember in each church, the Lord used an aspect of his resurrection manifestation to John to address the church. He is addressing a suffering church, a small church. A church with an uncertain future. A church with people living in fear, but it was well situated. He is a God who is holy. Very important. Two, he that is true. I'm holy. I am true. Truthful. I'm a God that you can trust. And God wanted the people to under this church to know that. What she was suffering. Look at the earthquakes. Look at the uncertain future. Look at the taxation. They were some, in spite of all of that, they were heavily taxed. And on top of that, paganism, the God of the Dionysus, the God, the God of Bacchanalia, wine, revelry, sex orgies. Could you imagine all of that? These things said he that is holy, he that is true, he that had the keys of David, he that opened and no man shut it. He opened, God is telling them, I want you to know who you're dealing with. I'm holy, I'm true, I have the power to open and no man can shut. And when I shut, no man, 
no dog, no earthquake, no human can open when I shut something. And God has given a message to the church. He, and he's saying to all of us who are suffering, those of us are going through very difficult periods because of COVID-19. Many cannot find jobs. Look what's going on right now with the oil price. Look what's going on with the war. COVID-19 is still around, mutating into other forms. The world will never be the same again. So we use the parallels as we move through it. He that opened it and shut it and shut it and no man can open. That's the power of the God we're dealing with. And God is saying to those of us listening tonight, he's saying to you as his child, just as he spoke to that church, those who are suffering and going through horrible encounters, he wants you to know, I am in charge. And if you love me, I'll reveal myself to you. Let's run on with verse 8. I know your works. The Greek word there is oida. Remember I told you of that word? It means to, to see. Oida means to see. But notice how it says, I know. The word I know there is means I see. But it's a knowledge-based on personal observation, what the Lord is watching, what he's paying attention to. And every one of us, this message is a message not only of great hope, but it must put us into the place where it must cause a sense of divine reverence to know that God is watching me. God is watching us. How many of us know tonight that God is watching Sister Mali, God is watching us. Sister Susan, we are being watched. Krista, Sister Borneo, man of God, Pastor Stephen, Sister Patsy, Sister Joanne, Sister Joyce, Sister Agnes, Sister Susan, Pastor Thompson. God is, verse 8, I know. I see, I order you, I'm observing you. He is the, the unseen guest in every home. He's a silent listener to every conversation. He's walking up and down. He's the Greek word there, peri pateo in. Peri means around and Pateo means he's walking around. You know, if we really believe the word of God, you don't need anyone to, 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 to chaperone and walk around. If a man really knows that God means what he's saying, we will live in a holy state. A state of divine reverence. Because we are being watched. Every time I say this, it plays in my own heart a sense of fear that God is saying, Earl, global, I'm watching you. You're being watched. You're watched by angels. You're watched by the Holy Ghost. You're watched by the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, and by the Father. I remember hearing an event where one of, I think, was. Um, one of these great men of God was taken to heaven and an angel was taking him around and showed him on earth a brother who was crying out. He was struggling with a weakness, crying out to God to help him. And just at the time when the Lord was releasing help for him, the angel that was coming towards him had to hold his hand because this brother, like he just gave up and he went into a life of sexual orgies. Many of us are at the brink where God is about 
to release and to do things. But God, you're taking too long, so I have to help myself. And they're giving up. And right at the time that God is about to give the break, people get frustrated and begin to behave inappropriate. David, we saw how David operated. That's right not. I know that your works and I have set before thee an open door. Remember each one of these churches. God is the one who's given the report card. Is that what you think of yourself? Is that what reputation the church has? Anybody can have a reputation. Anybody can pat themselves on the back. Is that, is that the, the, the compliments of men? Is what God is saying about us. What is he saying about us? Look at this here. I know that your works, behold, I have set before thee an open door. This church was something. What is the open door? And as we showed you, this Philadelphia had a political ambition of becoming those individuals, this country, to advance Greek culture, the Greek language, the Greek theater, the Grecian lifestyle, and they were called Little Athens. That was a personal ambition to become in really saturated with the refinement and the sophistication of the Grecian lifestyle. But God is telling the church with all of the economic downturn, all of the tremors, the earthquake, all of the fear that the average man refused to even live within the walls of Philadelphia. He said, I just where I have positioned you there and give you an open door. Even with all of the problem, he said, I'm, I'm giving you, this is an opportunity to evangelize, an opportunity to rise up. Is that a time to run and to hide? and to bury your head in the sand and say, oh no, it's too late. No, God is saying it's an opportunity to turn. I've set before you an open door and no man can shut it. For thou, and I want to say this, what is the opportunity that God has given to the church in this age with COVID-19? COVID-19. That's an open door. How many people in the light of what's going on began to think in their bones they can sense that something is about to happen. Their spiritual blood or the hair raised on their skin. Something beneath the surface is whispering into the ears of the people, something big is about to happen. Yes, we studied the book of Revelation. When you go through trouble, the trouble of this nature, God allows allow an opportunity, in spite of how dark it is, an open door is given. We can have one of the greatest evangelistic Turn around if we allow God to use us in the hour of political, in the hour of emotional, in the hour of all forms of fears. I, I always would remember looking, and I have it in my phone. I want to send you all, I think someone has, someone has sent me the text of in the middle of COVID-19, when COVID-19 was really destroying Italy, Italy, people began throwing their money into the street. Throwing money into the street. Why were they doing it? Because what the, they said, what's the value of having money if you're not going to live to enjoy it? They were throwing away their money. 
The street was filled with money. You know, the Bible says the days are going to come when a piece of bread will be able to buy a bag of gold. All the investment in stocks, bonds, all the different investment that we have in gold and other things, it will be of no value. Because you can't eat gold, you can't eat diamond. A piece of bread will be able to buy a bag of gold. That day, is, that day is coming. We are approaching it very, very, very quickly. Now, God says, I've said before you, an open door. In spite of all of us going on, it is still an opportunity. And I believe God is talking to you and I. If you and I as believers decide, Lord, I'm going to seek you. I will allow you to use me in Maloney, where I work where I go to school, I don't care who don't like me. If I have a chance, I'll get up in the bus and preach. I'll stand in the open street and start proclaiming God's word. God, it's a time, an open door. The opportunity is extended to the church, to the saints of God at such a time as this. He said, I've said before the open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength. They were suffering. All the things I said. Earthquakes. An uncertain future. Persecution. Lack of work. Because they were not willing to compromise. To eat food offered to idols. To burn incense on pagan altars. To get a certificate so they can work. They were beaten. They were bruised, they were pillaged, they were attacked by the Jews, they were run down by members of the public, dragged into stadiums and burned to stakes. God said, you have little strength. It wasn't a big church, you know. It was a small church, small son, group of people. And what God is saying to them, you have little strength. And but one thing with your little strength, Notice, with all of the problem, notice this. You have little strength. And nonetheless, you have kept my word. Regardless of what you're going through, be faithful. Be faithful to God. Be faithful to God. And God was impressed. It's not when you have all the money in the bank. It's not when you have all, all of the material hopes and all of your ambitions have come through. You can say, praise the Lord, I'm blessed. It seems as though when you study the church of Smyrna and now the church of Philadelphia, you're seeing a parallel. There is something about people who are suffering that the Lord seems to say, you've been going through enough. But with all of the suffering, what he said, you have little strength, but you have, you've kept my word. Many believers don't even read the Bible. Christians hardly even meditate. How you expect to make it if you don't meditate, if you don't study the scriptures. And the Lord is talking of this church, talking them up. You kept my word in spite of your little strength, in spite of your poverty, in spite of your lack, in spite of the demonization of the public, in spite of those from the synagogue of Satan, those Jews who were persecuting the church. You have kept my word and you have not denied my name. We saw that also in the church of Smyrna. And they had those also even in the church of Pergamum, a few of them, some even in the saddest church, a short list of names. And God said what? Kept my word. You have not denied my name. It's easy to go downstream 
but to swim against opposition, to swim against the, 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 the cascading waters of opposition and darkness and dread and the hurricane Katrina's and the hurricane, uh, amen, eons of the world coming against you, but you are faithful and you refuse to deny my name. It's not, it's not at the point of money and pleasure that God is impressed. We could be going to come to the last church, a suffering church, with all that they were going to. He said, I give you an opportunity. Even though you're going to go, be faithful to me. He kept his word. He did not deny his name. Look at verse 9. Behold, what will he do? When you begin to honor God like that, what will he do? Everybody look at this. What will he do when you begin to honor him like this? You remember that the scripture that says, them that honor me will I honor? Those that lightly esteem me, what will be their reward? Christians who refuse to stand up at the point of struggle and darkness, an opposition. Jesus said, if you refuse to own me before men, he said, I will refuse to own you before my father and before the angels. Think about that. Is it worth it? The Lord said, I will not even own you before my father. You refuse to own me before your friends. You refuse to identify yourself with me and the suffering few. You refuse to stand up in your school among your so-called big shot friends and be known among them. Look at verse 9. What will God do when you honor him like that? Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. What will he do? I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and they are not. But they're lying. You see the same thing like those in the church of Sardis who said that they were alive but God said you're dead. Those who say they are uh, uh, real Jews. The Lord said no, 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 no. You are from the synagogue of Satan. It's not what people say about themselves. You know. It's what God says about us. What is God saying about you and I? I want you to think. Write it down. What is he saying about you and I? It's not what you say about yourself. What is he saying about us? Concerning our commitment to him. Concerning our willingness to stand up in the face of opposition. In spite of the verbal attacks of others. In spite of being embarrassed by your friends and your neighbors and members of your family. That you said, I would not deny my Lord. Father Camp stood up at the age of 86. He says, these 86 years, I've served my Lord. He's done me nothing but, but good. How can I deny my Lord? Many of us who are afraid and ashamed to own the Lord. In the time of wealth, popularity, fame, youthfulness one day he said i will be ashamed to own you before my father and his angels let's run on those who oppose you who call themselves jews and they are not what will what will he do to your enemies to those who are attacking you I will make them to come and worship before your feet. Sister Bonnie, what do you think about that? Are you there? Pastor Stevens, get, give a comment. What do you think about that? Pastor Thompson, you have to forgive me. I'm kind of just reached home, so I'm jumping in and okay, out. Okay, I get you. I get you. Forgive me. Yeah, I yeah, get yeah. you, Peter. Okay. I get you. Right? Anyone? What is he saying? 
if you honor me like this, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I love you. When you decide to stand up with God and stand out, God said, well, I'm going to make your enemies bow down and bring them to your knees and I will let them know you are the object of my love. That is powerful. That when you stand up for God, God will stand up for you. When you least esteem him and you're ashamed to own him, he will be ashamed to own you. This is serious. This is a serious message. Look at this here. He said, I not only will I bring them to your knees, but I'll make them know that I love you. God is going to prove to those enemies who are trying to hurt you and shame you and embarrass you. He said, I'm going to make them know you are the object of my love. You are the apple of my eye. I, I always remember Stacy. I know she don't mind me talking about it, but I remember she wanted a husband. She wanted to settle. You know, she's my goddaughter, Stacey M. Jones. And she lived with me, our home. Had a nice job. And she brilliant, you know, brilliant girl. And um, she was studying and doing very well. And the next thing I saw, because I was staying in church, so I saw all the activities going on there. She came to church. Every evening I saw her from work, straight from work. She put a pause on her studies. And every evening after work, she'd drive her car up to the church and she would go in, come in, lay down before the Lord, read the word, pray. And I'm watching this. I said, wow. She didn't discuss any of that with me. She began seeking God. You know what the Bible says? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God said, everything else will be added to you. When you try to make things move on your own power, you're going to fall on your face. You may get by for a while, but you pay a price. And I saw months passing, and then the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, do you see what she's doing? I said, yes. Yeah. He said, tell her, tell her, because of her faithfulness, I am going to give her a husband. God is watching. God is watching. He hated the compromise. He knew it was hard for those who were in, under persecution in Smyrna. He knew it was difficult for those that were in Pergamum with those false teachers and the attack from the state and the Jews and from the community, the pagans coming after the church, throwing believers into the arenas, having them burned to the stake. They took uh, 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 this, uh, not Polycarp, um, what's his name? The, 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 the guy in um, uh, which church was it? Uh, Tyati, not Tyati. You had um, both Smyrna, Polycarp was there. And you had also, yes, the church of Pergamum. Though, uh, what's the name of that guy who, against all is his name, right? Who was burned in the belly of a metal cow and was willing to die. Antipas. God both, the Lord Jesus, boasts about Antipas. He called him my servant. 
willing to die. When people begin to, it's not when you have, you know, it's when they're struggling and you can be faithful in spite of what you're going through. That is the great price. Now, when you're loaded on with money and everything going, you're good and you're talking, and, oh, hallelujah, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Praise the Lord, we're blessed. Because you have money, because you have a, you bought a house, because you have money in the bank. We got it wrong. A lot of us are going to be surprised. This materialistic gospel that the church in America has disseminated to the world, now it has gone into Africa. And the Africans, I tell you, they are all doing everything that these prosperity preachers began preaching here in America. They're teaching the Americans how to be obscenely involved in wealth. That young lady, the Lord said, tell her. And I told her, I said, God told me to tell you because of your faithfulness. He's going to bless you with her husband. She's just smiling. Just, yeah, just continue. I was in my office the same year. She had made this commitment for the entire year, the year coming to an end. And I was in my office the earliest, after the earliest night service. And I heard a loud young people, you know, cry. Ooh! And I said, what's well, somebody? Come, as pastor, come. I walk in there. It was New Year's morning. That junior Jones knelt down on his knees and asked her if she would marry him. I never had a word with him or anybody. But when God speak, let me tell God don't need your help. A lot of us, we can't get blessed because we are not listening to God. We are allowing the pressure to get to us. The enemy, right at the brink of God, about to shift gears. That's what the enemy would do. Mess you up. Some of us, it may not be a husband. It might be your commitment to God's work. Your commitment to the church, your commitment to prayer, to fasting, to spiritual service, giving to God in spite of all that's going on. That's being faithful. You will not deny my work. You will not deny my service. And make your enemies bow down and let them know that I love you. People want to be like you. Look at verse. Again, verse 10. Sister Bonio, read verses 10 first. Let me get a different voice. I like Sister Bonio as she reads. You're there, Sister Bonio? Maybe she stepped away herself. So let me get, uh, who else can read? Krista, do a reading first in verse 10. Which version do you want? The King James? You can, read, you can read it in any version of your, uh, of your choice. All right, so I'll read it in the King James version. Okay, so verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the way, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, keep in mind, some people believe that this, all the earth refers, also include the great tribulation, which is to come, the tribulation. And that is, a, that is one of the views out there. I don't believe that. I, I, I believe that this was a local truth. These people were suffering. These were current promises God was making to them. The then known world as we know it, right? If you go back in the book of Acts, you would see when Agabus the prophet prophesied that great Derek will come to all the earth. Uh, 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 Brother Stevens? Um, who, anybody can find that scripture for me? 
Hold on. Let me see if I can find it here. This is it. I want you all to see this because I hear some people say, but this refers to the great tribulation. I, I, I don't accept that. I respect it. It's good for people to have their views. But I, I, I'm the then known world. Some people say well, ref, that refuse, refers to the future um, tribulation, which will infect the entire world. There are many events that occurred, like we have a, a, a worldwide pandemic, right? Uh, that, but we know people, technology people move all over the world faster with plane and, and all this kind of a stuff. But I want you to see this. Um, Agabus I don't visit Agabus the prophet Okay. Um, um, somebody, um, Krista, read for me Acts chapter 10. I want to make sure I get the right one. Acts chapter 10. Look at verse 1 for me. You get it? On if this is Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. Yes, sorry. I got it. Yeah. What is it? All right, Acts chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in is Caesarea, yeah, Caesarea. Yeah, Caesarea, yeah. Right, called Cornelius, a centurion of no, no, the band. No, no, hold on, hold on. Th that is not the one. Agabus, the prophet who prophesied that a great famine was going to come, if I'm not mistaken, in all the world. That's the point I'm trying to make. So some people believe that this all the world um, term used here is referring to the future um, tribulation that's coming, the tribulation. The fact that it uses the word all of all the earth, there were ma many major events in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in first century, in AD and BC period that impacted all what we know at the time as a then known world. Right? Um, let's come back. It's okay, Krista. Uh, uh, um, but I want to make a point here. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation or tribulation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. There were a lot of famines, all kinds of pestilence that was impacting the then known world. And God promised them, because of your faithfulness, this was personal. This was a personal, local, prophetic word that came to literally seven main churches in Asia. And God was saying to them, because of your faithfulness in spite of your problem, you have not denied my name, you have remained faithful, Right? And because of this, because of that dark day that's coming, I am going to protect you from it. I'm going to protect you. And I believe that as believers begin to live faithful to God, when hell begins to break loose, you mark what I'm saying. Many people will have supernatural encounters. Remember when God was judging um, Egypt? What did he do? He said that the, uh, uh, the line of demarcation between the Jews who were living in Goshen while he was judging all of Egypt. 
God has the wherewithal to protect his children in spite of all hell that will break loose. We could have, I am convinced there will be supernatural intervention. When people really begin to honor God, honor him, be faithful to him, God says, I'm going to honor them. To them that honor me, I will honor. I will keep them from the hour of temptation, tribulation, which shall come upon the whole world. While everybody's suffering, I will protect them. How many of you know that God has the ability to do that? He has the ability to do it. Look at verse 11, moving quickly. Behold, I will come quickly. Behold, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take your crown. That crown they refer to, to, to um, it's very easy for somebody to allow God's blessings and God's reward to, to, to elude you, to elude you. Don't allow any man to take the reward that I have in store for you. You can lose your reward because of people, because of an individual, because of what you're going through. You can lose your faith. Don't reach so close and walk away from it. I will, him that over, uh, in verse 11, hold fast to that which thou hast. In spite of all that you're going to hold on. Don't let anything, anyone steal your crown. Your crown refers to your rewards that I have in store for you. Many believers will turn their back on God because of pressure. Walk away and go into the world and backslide because they can no longer control themselves. God said, hold fast to what you have and don't allow any man to steal your reward from you. Look at verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make what? A pillar in the temple of my God. I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Hear this. And he shall go no more out. And I will write. I want you to see what God is telling them. These people are suffering, you know. They couldn't go into the city because of fear. They were living a life of uncertainty and hopelessness in the natural. And what God says, him that overcometh. There's a blessing for the overcomer. There's a blessing for those who persevere. A blessing for not giving up. Him that overcome it will I make a pillar, a pillar, a pillar. You know what a pillar is? A post that God will make you one of those individuals that would Stand before the God of a pillar in God's house. It doesn't matter. You don't have to have all the education in the world. But faithfulness to God, sticking out. God said, don't allow no man to, don't allow anyone to steal your reward. But more than that, if you overcome, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. You have to worry about earthquakes. You don't have to worry about being afraid to go into a city. You'll become a pillar in my house. You'll become a mainstay before my presence. No longer to suffer. No longer to roam. No longer to live in fear with little food, with high taxation. I will, you will stay before me. You will live in my presence as a pillar. Can you imagine? That you, God will use individuals like this to become, you know, a pillar is one who becomes someone that's major, who has a major contribution, a major part to play in the house, in the kingdom of God. Why would you want to give this thing up for one? Fleeting pleasure. Huh? In that overcome it, will I make a pillar 
in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And the, those Christians understood what this meant for what they were going through. And I will write upon him the name of my God. We're going to talk about that before we go into the last section next week. I'm going to hold that back for next week. And the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Look at the among the blessings. It's coming upon these who are faithful because of what they were suffering. Yet many of us do not want to suffer. Many of us want to backslide when the pressure, when it gets, when it gets too hot. Look at the list. It's a very long list. No other list is as long as this in the area of the blessings. I, 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 in the interest of time, I will not, I will just possibly put a list out there, but I'll just run over before we go into the last church next week. Verse 30, he that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. God is saying, what I'm telling you, take it seriously. This is not a pipe dream. This is for serious. Yes. The overcomer will be in verse 12. He will, he that overcomer will, make, will be made a pillar in the house of my God. He that overcomer shall go no more out. No more uncertainty, no more earthquakes, no more crying in the night, no more poverty and lack. Huh? No more will he go out, live in uncertainty, fear of what will come tomorrow. Thirdly, and I will write upon him the name of my God. God has a new name for you, a new name written. Even the Lord Jesus has a new name. That will be given to him. <laughs> yeah. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is in the new Jerusalem, the new world tomorrow, a world of tranquility, of peace, a world where, amen, the lion and and, and the deer will lie down together. A world with no more violence, no more pain, no more killing, no more poverty, no more famine, no more COVID-19. A world where you don't have no money to go to work and clock a card. No more having to fight two, three jobs to pay your bills. You'll go no more out, no more sweating. What a life. Be faithful, he's saying. Be faithful. Be faithful. You suffer. Whatever you're going through tonight, I pray that God will grant you the strength not to give up, not to give in, not to allow the pressure to squeeze you into submission. You say, I will be faithful. In closing, any comments before we close? Quickly, what is God's word saying to you? What is God's word saying? Quickly, don't be, I know, uh, at least you're already in your home. <laughs> um, Go on. No matter, no matter what I go through in life, I just want to hold on and stay strong in the Lord at all times. Yes. No matter what come my way, what I just do, Pastor, I don't put my focus on my problems or things around yes. me. I just put my focus on the Lord. Beautiful. 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 That's a good way to go. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Who else? Anyone else? What is this word saying to you personally? What's it saying to you? I want you all to read it through, go it through, read it for yourself. Anyone else quickly? I won't be too long. It's now one minute to nine. Uh, Pastor Thompson, I think um, Sister Susan had it there because, you know, 
ever since I came in, you know, what I've been hearing and what the Spirit has been saying, being faithful to God and the things of God. And, yeah. and that is where the blessing is going to come in. And the thing is about it, you know, it, you don't have to be out front to show off about it. The thing yes. about it is that God sees, God yes. knows. Yes, he God does. knows what's happening on the, on the inside and in, uh, in, in the hearts of men. You know, like yes. he, he, told, he, told, he told Samuel, he said, man, look at on the outward appearance, but yes, God looks yes. at the heart. And yes. God is looking, God is looking at the hearts of men and women, especially those of the body of Christ, that God, even at this time, what God sees, what God knows is the faithfulness of people in spite of what they might be going through in this present time, even in their own personal situation. Yes. But God sees, their, what, what he sees is people's faithfulness to him, not yes. in turning away, not having your problems yes. take you over. In yes. fact, I yes. believe when the problem comes, that is the time that we need to draw nigh to God. For the yes. Bible says, yes. if we draw nigh to him, that we're he will him. also draw not, um, near to us. And I believe this is the time, the, in all of the COVID and all of the situation, this is the time to draw closer to God than yes. you have ever been before. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Stephen. Appreciate that. Anyone else as we come to a close? Well, Pastor, it's more or less everything what um, Pastor Stevens and Sister Suzanne said. Once we remain faithful to God, he will remain faithful to us, you know, and once we hold fast to his word. Yes. And, you know, and, you know he will preserve us from what is to come yes. upon the earth, you know. So all of this is an incentive for us to, yes. you know, to remain faithful to him and you know, as much as possible, um, yes. you know, submit ourselves to him and, and he will protect us. Beautiful. Beautiful. Anyone else? You know, Pastor, mm -hmm. I just want to share, right? Yes. My sister-in-law, who I just came back from Florida, yes. right? She's a very strong Christian there church. I went to their church this Sunday. Yes. And they went on a missionary trip for two weeks. To yes. Thailand. And you know, during Wednesday and Thursday, I wrote her, you know, asked her how things going and so on. And she was saying, you know, I mean, we have it so easy. Yeah. So she was saying that we, even where they were there, you know, she said that they, there was this pastor who was beaten and tortured to death. And yet the church remained, you know, continuing yes. witnessing. Wow. And praising God. Yes. You know, I told her, say, you know, I'm going to bring, you know, we will really pray for them. It's a church in Thailand. Okay. They, you know, they, they went to this missionary trip. And she said it was amazing to see the, yes. you know, the, the strength that in spite of all the people, she said, beaten and burned to death in front of the people, you know. Wow. Well, that is, that's what is going on in, in the church of Smyrna. And the church of Pergamum. Yeah. You know, we, those days are coming back in us, Sister Bonnie. Yeah, yeah. The, the stage is being set. And I believe that God is allowing us to go through these teachings to prepare God. This is the way you're going to get ready. Listen to the stories. Go through each letter. Go through every exhortation. And make a personal application. That's the secret. Thank you, Sister Bond. Anyone else? Has one, one more. Amen. Let's bow our hearts in prayer tonight. And after I'm through, Pastor Stephen will give the final word to those who are here. But let's bow our hearts in prayer. Um, I saw my. Jesse, good to have you on tonight again. God bless you. Uh, I believe that God is going to do something in his heart. In the heart of this young man. Amen. God is going to bless you, son. You have a heart for the things of God. I pray that God will make himself so real to you. Let's bow hearts in prayer. Father, I live before you tonight. Sister Susan. 
in Maloney, Jesse, Pastor Stevens and First Lady, Sister Joanne, Faithful Sister Krista, Sister Bonnie in the home, Sister Joyce, Sister Patsy and the family, Sister Agnes in the home, Sister Marlene and the household, and Sister Susan Clark and their home. Spirit of God, thank you for the privilege of feeding your children with your word. May the truth spoken over this church of Philadelphia become real to us. God, whatever we are going through, to be faithful. Whatever the struggle, that we be faithful. Whatever the attack, that we be faithful to you. Holy Spirit, lay your hands upon each one, especially those who are walking through the valleys of the shadows of death, those that are suffering financial hardship, mental hardship, emotional distress. God, I'm asking that you will cause your presence to be released upon your children as you have never seen it done before. I commend in to your hands. These your children tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. This is our second to last letter. We have one more letter. We close on the church. The message to the seven churches. Next week, Wednesday, the will of the Lord. And then we're going to be moving through this book. All the drama. It's almost like you're going to come to a point where a movie is now picking up action and you're coming towards the end and drama, you'll be at the edge of your seat. That's where we're going with this. A lot of, I mean, listen, you want to know what's going to happen to this earth? We have one more letter. Those are the seven messages to the church. That's why we have to go through it. But then we're going to look at the rest what is about to happen throughout the world. The Antichrist, uh, the judgment that's coming. Hardship that's coming, famine, death, killing, antichrist. We're coming to that. It's scary, you know. You no Hollywood producer will be able to produce a movie of what we about, what is about to be released upon this earth. And Jesse, Pastor. my son, hold in there. Sister Bonio, go ahead. No, I said, Pastor, there was there a long ago. It, this was a frightening book. To read. Yes. It was very, very yes. scary. When you think I didn't use I didn't like this book. It at all. It it was, yes. Yes. It was really scary. <laughs> yes. And no, but it is something that is scary for a man who does not know God. But those who want to be prepared, be prepared. You have loved ones, you have children who are not serving God. We have one more letter in the church and from when we're starting our prayer and fast. This is November. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Pastor Thompson, yes. It's going to be the last week in the month of November. We take Beautiful. Week and uh, we, we, we'll finish it off with the, um, when we come to our communion. And then yes. we we take a, we take in a week in the in month January. of January also. That, that's, yeah. good. that's good. That's yeah. good. That's good. That's good planning, Pastor Stevens. Yeah. That's good planning. That's good. So so we have we want to wrap up, introduce. We'll wrap up next week, God's willing, the message to the uh, the last church, and that church that church represents more than any time what we are going through right now, the Laodicean church. That church is a clear depiction of what's going on in Christianity today. <laughs> it's going to be razor edge. What the Lord had to say to that church. Well, you think what he told um, Sardis last week is bad? We come into Laodicea. We, we're going to talk about it. Let's let's uh, so Pastor Stevens, um, I hand this over into your hands.